podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Sports fans, come experience the FanDuel Sportsbook at Live Casino and Hotel for all your sports betting action. The ultimate place for any sports enthusiast. Take advantage of our 24-7 kiosks, massive video screens, and watch all the action from the best seat in the house. Make every moment more at the all-new FanDuel Sportsbook at Live Casino and Hotel in Hanover, Maryland. Please play responsibly. Gambling problem? Please call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit mdgamblinghelp.org. Welcome to another Love Tennis Podlet, what I believe will be the last mini-pod of the French Open as we return to once a week full pods, at least for a couple of weeks. My name's James Gray from inews.co.uk and the i newspaper. I've got George Belshaw, the tennis writer, with me here today as well. We're going to look forward to the men's final, which is taking place in a few hours' time, and we'll also look back at the women's final yesterday as Iga Shontek swept aside Coco Goff. But we'll start with the men's because it is imminent. We're recording this on Sunday morning, so we're just a few hours away from Rafa Nadal against Casper Ruud. It's Rafa Nadal's 14th French Open final. He has won all 13 of them. Kasper Ruud said on Friday he reckons he has watched all 13, uh, which it's going to be maybe the first time that this has ever happened, that someone's going to come into a French Open final having watched all of their opponents' previous matches and not necessarily for research. Uh, George, how big a challenge is this for Kasper Ruud? Well, if he's watched them all, he knows exactly where his weaknesses lie and how to beat him, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat this. I'm pretty sure Nadal's going to kill him, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's It just feels like everything's slightly lent into Nadal's favour in the kind of back end of this tournament. Mm. Um, I think, well, obviously, you know, there's a very of match. I thought he was going to lose that. I was certain he was going to lose that because it was just projected to last so long. And I was like, Nadal can't cope with this. Ferrer's playing really, really well. He's going to kind of physically struggle as this goes on and on. And of course, it was Zverev's ankle who snapped or whatever his foot uh, ligaments, lateral ligaments in his foot in the end. Um, so that was kind of quite lucky in a way because they'd been playing for three hours and not even completed the second set, which... Mm meant it was kind of on for a seven hour match if they played <laughs> just like four sets uh i um, i can tell you george as someone who had already done that maths I, i'm not saying i was happy when alexander's very did his foot <laughs> but it, it certainly changed my plans for the evening that that's for sure yeah um and I, you know the thing is from rude's perspective who, who's, who's he beaten? I mean, in terms of like top draw players to get there, it's really opened up for him. He's avoided Sissipas. He's avoided Medvedev. Okay, Marin Cilic was playing really good stuff and he kind of took him out. And, but for a first time semi final to get Cilic there is hmm. pretty pretty nice at this stage in Cilic's career. So, yeah, I'm not. Nadal's been pushed hard by Novak and Zverev without physically collapsing and he's obviously had a tough match with Felix so you know Rude will be hoping he's perhaps been pushed too hard but I th- I sense that having got out of just two sets against Zverev he's going to be fairly fresh for this and um, you know Rude needs to play a perfect match and hope Nadal is well well below his average to have a chance I think I, I quite enjoyed a little comment from Rude where he said I've played um I can't remember the number, but it's something like I've played, you know, ninety practice sets with Nadal over the years at the Academy and I've never won one. So that that doesn't exactly bode bode well taking back some match conditions. <laughs> um it's quite interesting you talk about Nadal's physical state. Um he has obviously sort of tried to avoid talking about it too much. He says he's got this foot problem and he'll talk about it afterwards. He's got his doctor there, um Angel, Angel Ruiz Cutiro, uh, there in Paris with him. Um, we think that he's either having nerve blocking injections or maybe cortisone or something similar just to kind of get him through it. I thought it was interesting, Nadal over the last couple of days, certainly between the Djokovic and the Zverev match, was practicing over at Jean Boehm, which for anyone who knows is kind of across two roads outside of the Roland Garros main site. And it's kind of it's a different. It's a different place. Um, it's it's not really open to the public. A few people usually are in there, but it's not. You haven't got crowds. Um, and I thought it was interesting that he was practicing there before the Zverev match, and then on Saturday he turned up on court number two and did a practice session in front of a full set of bleachers. 
Um, yeah, I'm not saying it was a massive crowd, but you know, every seat that was available on court number two, of which there are a couple of hundred, was full. And that felt to me like previously he was hiding away. And then he was like, no, no, I'm going to do a 90 minute practice session on a hot day in front of a crowd. That felt like a bit of a kind of power move. Yeah, I just I just sense he's totally relaxed, confident about this. It's it's an ideal final in many ways. It's someone who knows really, really well. They've played together at his academy over the years. It's someone who clearly has so much respect for him, is in kind of awe of him, who's going to be playing in this kind of these conditions for the first time in his life um, under massive pressure. You know, I know we'll go on to the women's final in a bit, but I can imagine it just being quite similar to how Goff really played, you know, mm. just not quite happening against someone who's been there, done it. Um, and, you know, whilst Fiontech's only been there and done it once, you know, she's won like five titles of the year. Nadal's been there and done this 13 times before. He's never lost at this stage at the French Open. Um, and it's, it's, it's very hard to kind of say it'll definitely happen. And, and that's not because I don't rate Rude. I think he's a really good player and he's, you know, He's definitely established himself as a very, very good top 10 player and one of the best clay quarters. Um, and, you know, I think he's kind of won us round a bit as well. I think that's fair to say. Like we mm. maybe prodded a few jibes at him last year when he was going and picking up three clay court titles after Wimbledon sort of thing, you know, the, the dead end clay court um, tournaments. But, you know, for him to kind of come into a Grand Slam final, even even in kind of good conditions in terms of op opponents um that that shows a lot of kind of mental strength from his side because it's, it's almost harder when you're like the favorite like coming into like the quarterfinals to get there in, in many ways mm. um so he's, he's handled that really well um and hopefully he makes a good match of it yeah he you're right about him kind of going up in our estimations because yeah, we did kind of lightheartedly um, dig him in the ribs a bit about, you know, going and picking up those titles in Bastad and Gestad and places like that. Um, but, you know, that is perfectly reasonable. Like, those tournaments happen. It's not illegal to go and play them. And, you know, he did beat the odd top 50 player here and there. And it, you have to say that it has come off. Like, the fact that he played something... I think he might have played 40 clay court matches in 2021 in fact i'll tell you exactly it was 33 clay court matches in 2021 which i'm pretty sure will be more than any other i would suggest top 30 player barring maybe christian garin if he's back in the top 30 um and you have to say he's now in the french open final and and that that has worked he's come in he knows the surface really well he knows his own game really well um and yeah he he's under no kind of he knows exactly how hard this final is going to be. Like, he knows Rafa Nadal is the king of clay. He knows this is his house. And as you say, George, he's played against him enough in practice, even though he's never played a competitive match against him. He knows exactly what he's up against. Um, what do you think he can do to, if at all, upset the apple cart and try and find a weakness in Rafa's game? I think... If Casper is listening and wants my advice for how to go about this, is it would just simply be keep him out there as long as possible. You know, mm -hmm. keep, keep him, keep the sets long. Don't rush. Don't give him. You know, make sure you're moving him about as much as possible. Don't get frustrated when he's pushing forehand winners past you, which is going to happen early on in that match. You know, you mm. you have to look at that match with Djokovic um, in the quarterfinals. You know, the Nadal's going to be hot when he comes out of the first set and a half. That's okay. You have to, you know, Novak got blown away. He was looked comfortably second best, and he just yeah. dug in. And I, I know he lost that match, but that can teach Rude a lot of lessons. I think in terms mm. of just keeping <laughs> keeping calm. It happen, if it can happen to Novak, it can happen to you. But he will drop. He won't be able to keep up that level for four hours, given his current physical condition. He might keep it up for two, and that might be enough to win the match pretty handily, two one and one. Um, but, you know, just keep him out there. And, you know, Rude, I think, you know, we, we spoke a bit about him on clay there. He's he's also reached a hardcore Masters final this year. You know, he's mm. really improved his all-round game. And he, I know he lost that to Alcaraz, but everyone's been losing to Alcaraz this year, so there's no shame in that either. And, no. you know, that I do think experiences like that can help. I'm not saying it's as big as a French Open final, but if he'd not even kind of gone to a Masters final before this, I'd be even more worried than I am. And this is someone who thinks it's about 99% likely <laughs> Nadal's going to win this in straight sets. Um, 
but yeah, I think just grind, keep him there. And and Rude's a good player, like Moncler. You know, he he will stay out there. He's it's not uncomfortable for him. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not talking myself into giving him a chance, but I, I hope he can make a good match of it because it's we've had some really good matches in the second week. It was a bit of a damp first week of the French Open, mm. um, and then it's kind of hit new levels, mainly through Nadal, to be honest, in the men's yeah. side. You know. The Felix match, the Djokovic match. Zverev played his part against Alcaraz as well. That was a really, really great match. Um, and then, you know, Nadal Zverev was top draw stuff before um, the misfortune for Zverev. Yeah. So it'd be nice to have a final to kind of match the rest of the week, really. Um, I think what you'll also find is conditions may end up suiting Casper Ruud. Um, the forecast today is not great in Paris. It's already really humid. I can tell you that right now, sitting in my flat. Um, I've had the window open all night. It was incredibly warm last night. Even though it absolutely hammered down with rain after the women's final, it didn't seem to clear the humidity particularly. And it is now very humid. We are probably going to have another thunderstorm this afternoon. I'd be surprised if this final isn't at least partially played under the roof. And one thing we know about this roof is it creates a lot of humidity. And what we saw in the Zverev Nadal match was it slowed the whole match down. Now... God help us if that happens again, because I don't think it was a particularly good spectacle. Uh, people at home may disagree. I spoke to a few people afterwards who watched it on telly and said it was great. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just the Nadal factor. He did play some great tennis, but you have to think that if Casper Ruud in particular is going to win this match, he wants the roof to be closed, because it takes so much sting off of the Nadal forehand. It took him an hour and 20 minutes to hit a forehand winner against Zverev because he couldn't get it through the court. The ball was so big and fluffed up um, and frankly the players were working so hard for it. Um, the, the physiological thing is that in humidity it's much harder to regulate your body temperature basically because sweat doesn't work. If it's humid, you're sweating and the air is also wet and therefore the sweat doesn't evaporate off you. It doesn't take the heat and all of a sudden it gets very hot indeed. Yeah, and in Rude's mind, he's got to sit there thinking, "I'm 23. This bloke's 36. Yeah, I, I've got to, I've got to believe I can outlast him. If nothing else, I've got to believe that it becoming a physical slog is going to help me. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for Rude, it probably means his weapons aren't going to hit through Rafa either. And sometimes I think you need to take the racket out of Nadal's hands on these courts. So whether that is an advantage or not, I, I, I'm not not 100 percent convinced either way. And Nadal still is a physical monster who will take take some beating either way but yeah mm. keep it long keep with him and you've got a one percent chance <laughs> uh, I, I am slightly concerned that the majority i mean i was just looking at casper rude's record yesterday and when it comes to long matches um in the last year he's played four matches over three hours and he's lost three of them and the only one he won was against Yao souza he lost to botich around his Angeloup in the US Open, he lost to Jordan Thompson in five sets at Wimbledon, and he lost to Karina Booster in Barcelona. You know, almost all of which, Karina Booster maybe aside, you would expect him to win under normal circumstances. Now, I don't know, he might have had a massive preseason, but um, that would just slightly concern me looking at those results. Um, yeah, go on, George. Yeah, so let's change our tactical analysis and say keep it as short as possible go for as many wins. <laughs> no, I think he, no, I think he has to play. I still think he has to play long, irrespective of what his strengths are. I sometimes think against Rafa, you do have to play the man and not play your own game, which is sort of what players always say. You know, oh, just play my own game. I don't actually think that's relevant, Rafa. Like, if you play your game, he will beat you. He he is better at his game than you are at your game. That's why he's a thirteen-time Roland Garros champion. Um, I thought it was really interesting. In the Zverev match, and it's partly to do with Zverev's particular game, but he served, especially in the ad court, almost exclusively to Nadal's forehand. Um, and I think basically it was so that his plus one was more often a backhand strike rather than, you know, serving to Rafa's backhand. He puts it back into your forehand wing and all of a sudden you've got to try and hit a forehand and not let him hit the big inside out forehand, which is actually the big weapon. So weirdly, he was serving to Rafa's forehand to avoid and nullify Rafa's forehand. And I do wonder, I mean, Rude's backhand is good, but his strength is his forehand as well. And I wonder whether he might try the same thing, but so that he can get his own inside out forehand going. Yeah, I mean, the, the Nadal forehand uh, has been kind of a source of quite a lot of tactical intrigue over the year because 
Djokovic really overcame Nadal on clay by just taking the forehand on. Like, mm. I think everyone's just assumed because he can just stick it down the line whenever he likes with ridiculous amounts of rotations and huge speed from any angle that you need to avoid it. Whereas actually, if you attack the forehand, hit heavily into it and get defensive shots back, then you get more opportunities to attack into the backhand, which is what yeah. Novak's been so good at. Whereas if you keep attacking into the backhand and allow him, and when you attack into the forehand, if you don't get that attack right, he is going to pass you up the line every time. And we always say you know, it's one of the most wonderful shots in tennis, those kind of banana shots he comes up with down the line. But actually, if you flip it on his head, get on top of the forehand, which isn't easy, by the way. I'm not saying this is something players can do easily. It takes a kind of top top level guy like Novak to be able, and Zverev, to be fair. Um, and I think that speaks volumes of how good Zverev is, that he was able to kind of take him on on that yeah. side a bit more. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's not easy. But Rude is, Rude is good enough if he plays his, his best tennis to attempt that tactic. Whether he's good enough to handle the pressure of playing in a first Grand Slam final, trying that, um, I'm not so sure. But but this again is where like practicing with him over the years is probably helpful. Like mm. he probably will have had a few chances to mix things up, um, test everything about him. He'll know how good Rafa's forehand is, and will have seen it in kind of similar settings because Nadal practices as he plays matches there's not many players you can probably actually get a pretty good read on from a practice compared to a match whereas Rafa is one of them who will just turn up exactly the same way all the time bringing that same intensity so Brood probably is as, as good a position as anyone to kind of uh, attempt that but uh, uh, yeah again I, I'm still at the 1% mark in terms of his chances <laughs> Goodo, uh, don't bother watching the final then, because Rude's only got a 1% chance. Um, I, I think, actually, I joke, really, Nadal's always worth watching in a final, because I think yeah. he's he's that good to watch um, when he's playing well. He's been well. brilliant this tournament, hasn't he? I mean, he, 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 he is box office when he gets in these tight matches. And I think that, you know, my issue with Nadal, uh, issue is very strong. It's not an issue for him, but in the French Open the last few years, or the kind of last five, six years, apart from the kind of big... Novak matches like there's just he just rolls people over and it's just not that interesting because they can last like three hours he takes an hour a set to beat someone and mm. it's like one two and one and it's like amazing because you know rappers so good but they're not close but every time Nadal's in like a close match it is the best matches on tour they, they just are he makes he makes tight matches deep um, five setters four setters they're, they're always so engaging because he's so pumped and he's got such a unique style but you need to feel he's in the match um, for it to really feel like a proper spectacle um, so I hope I hope we get a degree of that I mean if Rude can take the first set for example that'll be absolutely fantastic that will be yeah. that'll just create an extra atmosphere it will get the crowd going but you can just see it now that it'll just win it 6-1 the first set <laughs> take the sting out of it um, and Rude might kind of lobby kind of rally in the kind of final set where he's swinging freer got nothing to lose mm. and lose that one six four and lose the first two like two and three that, that's kind of how i'm seeing the match going not again not to put you off watching you'll still be unbelievable and you know it's we we should be saying as well it, the guy could win his 14th here that's as many slams as sampras got yeah in i mean all slams I mean, that's unbelievable i don't think you can overstate that no it's crazy it would be Utterly ridiculous, wouldn't it? Um, let's move on to yesterday's final. Um, I, I should point out we haven't left it to the end of the podlet for any other reason than you might be wanting to watch the men's final and you might want to get your men's final preview out of the way. Um, it was Iga Shontek versus Coco Goff, as you well know. Uh, Iga Shontek won, as we knew and at least we thought before it ever came to pass. 6 1, 6 3, she triumphed. Um, Coco Goff says she wasn't nervous until she lost the first three games. I think that's probably not true. I think she played nervous. Um, that was certainly my impression anyway. She looked nervous from pretty much from the outset. Um, George, what what do you make of, of the result and of the way Goff played? And, and what do you have hope that this will not be the, the last and certainly the most one-sided? Um. I, I'm certain it won't be her last Grand Slam final, yep, and I'm certain she will win plenty of slams. Um, mm. You know, reaching a Grand Slam final at 18, we shouldn't be viewing as a bad thing, it's just that we rate her so highly that this feels disappointing. 
yeah. I would say. Um, wasn't a great match. Um, I never really felt Sviontek was going to let it slip. There were about two games at the start of the second set where you vaguely thought Goff might be digging in, might be about to turn it around. Um, but Sviontek's just too good, and there's no shame in that at the minute. She's just too strong, too powerful. It, I think I texted you saying it was kind of you know, the old football cliche, men against boys. It just looked yeah. like someone who's fully developed into a, a complete winning machine versus someone who is brilliant and one of the most talented players on the tour, but not at that level quite yet. You know, there are still kind of uh, chinks in her armor, uh, Goff, particularly that second serve. I mean, that got brutal treatment all game long. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be too harsh on Goff because it's an 18-year-old played a Grand Slam final. That isn't something you want to kind of say, God, she was awful. It was terrible. She really didn't stack up to it. Is she ever going to kind of get up to that level? Um, but because of how good we know we are, and because we know how well she has coped with pressure in the past, I was maybe yeah. a bit more disappointed. Um, but it just goes to show she is human and is going to develop into a great athlete. And I thought her speech was great again. And I think she's brought so much to this tournament again in terms of she's such a great character. And this is a rival we, we want to see develop. But everyone is playing catch up to Sviontek right now. And that, there's no hiding it. I mean, if you get a set off her at the minute, I know Calvin takes the mick out of us when we say that. And because you know he's like how can you possibly treat that as a good standard you know getting set <laughs> off someone but she's so good at the minute isn't she i mean you just i, I think that's a great result if yeah. i ever got a point off her i'd be delighted at the moment it was it was really interesting because um i sort of noticed it on court and then goff mentioned it afterwards which is, is always satisfying as an you know as an amateur and, and as someone who's not played tennis to any sort of level to notice something on court that's happening and then for a player to bring it up afterwards be like yeah so the problem is this and basically the problem for golf yeah the forehand was leaky even when she had, she was set but most of the time she was having to hit it on the run or half on the run she was never getting to the ball setting and then able to unload and I think that's the problem with Chontek is that she hits the ball so hard and relatively flat most of the time that you just have no time on the ball I think the the other thing that really stood out to me is how many of her winners are actually landing about a meter inside the lines they're not she doesn't need to hit the corners to just take the ball beyond you um with relative ease and you know that that's kind of scary in a way because i think you can kind of handle it as a as a player when you know right they've just kept dusting the lines all match long there's not much i can do about it but when you're seeing that ball land pretty comfortably inside the court and you're not even getting within three meters of that ball. You're kind of like, crikey, they can improve by about a meter here. They've got a lot of margin for error. I need to yeah. up my game, you know, by like three meters worth of difference. That that that's pretty demoralizing. And I think it, it you could kind of sense that from Goff when a few of those balls were going past her, particularly in the second set once she'd kind of got her her, her claws back into the match. That it, you could just see it all being kind of the life being sucked out of her when. Just it, it didn't even look hard for Sviontek, which is crazy because it is hard. It, that's one of the things, again, we have to overstate with these players who make it look so easy. It's not easy at all. Like To hit that freely, cleanly in a Grand Slam final, it's only her second Grand Slam final, by the way. Mm. You know, She looks like she's been there 14 times like Rafa. It, it's just, she's superb. And all we've said about her all year, Sviontek, is can she do it when it matters? Can she handle the infamous day break between Grand Slam matches as I, I like to bang on about and you know turns out yes it turns out yeah pretty comfortably <laughs> um, it, it was worth noting that Coco Goff was in tears on the court it, always that horrible sort of 10 minute interlude um, after a final where you know Shantek ran up to her box and she hugged everyone she noticed Robin Lewandowski who she didn't know was there and there's a great photo of her just being like you you're here and then they have a lovely embrace and i know they are the two biggest celebrities in poland so that's a massive deal um and while shontek's doing all of this goff is just sitting in her chair like sobbing into her towel at one point and you know her dad was in tears up in the box and it, you just sort of wanted someone to go over and give her a hug um amelie moresbo came over and put a hand on her shoulder and they had a little quick chat and i'm sure coco goff just went yeah i'm fine i'm just sad i lost um, which is like a perfectly reasonable emotion to have. Yeah, uh, it's quite funny because Sviontek is a bit of like a, 
an awkward person as well. And I could see her at kind of the end of the match. She sort of went in for the really big embrace. You just tell Siontek's not necessarily that comfortable. She's a bit of an scenario. introvert, isn't she? <laughs> and she? There was a moment straight after the hug where you kind of felt she wanted to make it last longer and it kind of fell apart. And then she just gave like three pats on the shoulder. Like oh. she just like went over to it. <laughs> and I was just like, I know for Fiance, that's a really loving moment, but that yeah. came across like so awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> I think they do seem to have genuine, like, I don't know if they're friends. They don't necessarily seem to be, but they seem to have real large amounts of respect for each other. Um, yeah. They certainly, I, you know, those speeches afterwards, they're always sort of like, oh yeah, you know, aren't you great? But I, I think they were genuine. They were heartfelt. Um, and yeah, it was it was actually quite quite moving. You don't hear many bad words about either of them, which no. is always a decent barometer. Um, yeah. I'm not saying players come off and you know have a have a uh, slanging match in press conferences, but you you hear on the grapevine, yeah, you know, so and so is not getting on with someone else, or she's being a real dickhead basically um, yeah. to a team, etc. I've never heard anything no. negative about either of them, so. Um, I just wanted to bring up one more thing that she said in the press conference afterwards, Coco Goff, which she sort of half cried through. She was just a bit tearful and, and you know, um, someone said, you know, the tears, are they tears of pride? Are they tears of disappointment? Like, there's a lot to be proud of in what you've achieved. What, why the tears? And she said, I'll quote it. I, yeah, I think for me, I just don't know how to handle the emotions right now. So the tears just come. And then she smiled and cried some more. Um, I tried really hard not to cry on the court, whether I won or lost. Uh, but really, I was feeling really happy and sad. So it's like, I don't know how to handle that. I hate myself for crying. I even told the drug testing lady, do I look like I've been crying for so long? I don't know whether to smile or cry. I imagine also drug testing might have taken quite a long time because you're like both dehydrated from having played sport <laughs> and dehydrated from crying a lot. Um, but yeah, it was, she carries herself so well. And, you know, similarly, Shrontek in her um, victory speech, the biggest round of applause was when she said, I want to say one more thing to the people of Ukraine to stay strong. And then there was 30 seconds of applause and then she says, when I did this for the first time in Doha, I thought I might not have to do it again next time I won, but it's still going on, which it was a very moving moment. And, you know, Poland is a country that has done a huge amount in terms of um, providing aid and support for the refugees from Ukraine. And, you know, Igor Shontek clearly plays a, a significant public role. And on the stage there, you had two women who are between them 40 years of age and both of them have used their platform to stand up and speak about what they think is right um and i know we criticize athletes when they get that wrong but we should also laud it when they get that right and yeah. i know that's also subjective but we know what we think the right side of right is and we think gun violence and war are wrong and i don't think that's a controversial opinion um so I, I think most people can get behind that uh and yeah i'm all for women you know standing up for what they believe is right and and using their platform um speaking of successful women georgie had something to say I, I was just going to wonder whether we were going to venture into the other press conference sviontek moment well, uh right yeah um yeah i suppose we should certainly talk mention it i mean i think it's a bit of an open and shut case um a journalist, I'm not going to name him, people will know who he is uh, from reading the question. Uh, I'll read you what he said. One technical question and one which is not. The technical is, what's your best shot? Someone says it's the forehand, some say it's the return down the line backhand. What do you think? This is the first question. The second question is, players we've seen in the past, uh, sorry, outside of the court, when you go to a party, do you use makeup? Do you like to get elegant and smart and so on? Because many players we have seen in the past, they were staying hours in front of the mirror before going on court and using the makeup. And you seem very natural like this. And she says, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I'm wearing a hat. And she talks about her hair a bit. And then she's like, well, uh, makeup. Yeah, wow, I don't have that in my PR brief. It's hard to answer. Um, I mean, she took it absolutely fine. Yeah, she answered it well. Uh, it obviously created a storm afterwards. The reality is she's like the world number one player. She's won 35 tennis matches in a row. She just won the French Open. And like 40 years ago, everyone would have been really concerned about what makeup she wears. 
but like it's a tennis press conference and yes we want to hear about the people and the personality but like whether she wears makeup or not and like how good she is in the kitchen these are stereotypes and tropes from a totally different era and i really don't think it's worthwhile us probing them no uh, hard hard to disagree um i think uh, it's one of these things isn't it i mean if if it's an interview in something like vogue magazine where they're talking about fashion and you know mm. there's kind of appropriate context for a lot of those questions i suppose um but i don't see like i am asking it in a fight straight after a grand slam final where as you say she's absolutely thrashing everyone on the tour she is the dominant force she should be like being positioned as you know the massive thing in tennis at the minute you know on either tour because she's she's taking it to a level that you know she's gone past serena williams's best win streak in the 21st century that, like, that's unbelievable yeah so you can't you can't overstate this achievement and then we're talking about a question about makeup i mean it's just not the time place or or person to ask it i, suspect. <laughs> I think um i think someone said to me and i agreed with it afterwards said in a, in a one-on-one interview in a bit of context i think it would be a fine question you know if you were talking about i don't know being at the top of the game and having to worry about all these new things you should i think eager didn't have a clothing deal till quite recently for example yeah. um and you could maybe say you know how do you think about your appearance like are you someone who puts makeup on before you play tennis or are you someone who doesn't worry about the way you look on the court or like because you would ask that question of a man as well. Like, I think you, you absolutely could if you had someone like, I don't know, Rafa Nadal. You might be like, Rafa, tell me about the capri pants and the cut-off sleeves in the early days. Do you regret those decisions? And if not, why not? Um, you know, I, I think I'm desperately hoping, and I was uh, talking to someone at dinner last night, and I was saying, can you please ask Rafa Nadal in his press conference tomorrow whether he wears makeup when he plays tennis and whether he wears makeup afterwards? Because... It, I think it would maybe make a bit of a point. And I think hopefully Rafa would know the context and might laugh at it. Um, yeah, it's kind of nonsense. It's the kind of journalist who gives us all a really bad name. I don't think anyone in the room thought that was a reasonable question. Um, the journalist in question is in his 70s and maybe from a country where feminism is a bit further behind, I would maybe humbly suggest. I don't know. Someone said to me again last night at dinner, look, there are cultural differences in that room where in different countries, different things. Anyway, it turned into a hell of a spat. There were actual confrontations in the press room afterwards, which oh, were there? I can't possibly uh, illuminate oh, any further, that's, George, on air. That's, that's about the most interesting thing we've said today, George. Didn't, didn't <laughs> I will that. tell you about it privately. <laughs> and anyone who wants to become a premium subscriber to the podcast can yeah. uh, find that, out This could be the time it. to launch our Patreon. <laughs> that's something people seem to do when they've got things worth sharing. Yeah. Um, the one final thing I wanted to say um, was about... Lucy Havlikova, uh, she won the girls' uh, French Open title, which we know is a little bit of a pathway to uh, to greatness, quite frankly. Coco Goff won the girls' title at the French Open uh, four years ago. Iga Swiatek was in the semi-finals that year, as was Leila Fernandez. So it, it's certainly something that tends to be a good indicator of future French Open success. Uh, it's also worth noting that Lucy Havlikova then won the doubles. Uh, so she's clearly having a very good fortnight. Would you like to guess what country she's from? She's from the Czech Republic. Uh, the semi-finals of the girls had three Czech girls in it. Um, Lucy Havlikova, Sarah Bel- Bezlek, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, and Nikola Bartonkova. Um, there were two Czech teenagers in the main draw, uh, Linda Furutova and Linda Noskova, both of whom looked really, really good. I mean, the factory line, George, is just stupid. Yeah, it's probably one of the um, <clears throat> lesser told stories of the women's game at the minute. Probably because they've not... I mean, I know Kvitova's, Kvitova's won a few slams, but for the quality they've got, they've maybe not dominated right at the top as well yeah. as they could. But in terms of strength and depth, you know, stuff like the Fed Cup, they were always incredibly competitive. You know, they thumped Britain in the Fed Cup, uh, sorry, the Billie Jean King Cup recently um, without even close to their best squad. I mean, yeah. they, they just have wonderful strength and depth. And if this was a team sport, 
they would be Real Madrid at the minute. You know, they'd yeah. be killing everyone. Not that I necessarily think Madrid are actually the best uh, club <clears> in the world, but just seeing as they've just won a big European title, we'll give it to Oh, them. thanks yeah. for bringing that up. <laughs> um, I know you were so happy with that event yeah. in Paris this week. They've got eight players in the top 80 in the world. 10% of the world's top 80 players are from the Czech Republic. And, you know, in relative terms, it's an absolutely tiny country. I think there's only about 10 million people living in the Czech Republic. You know, that, that is nothing when you compare to, I don't know, the UK. <laughs> um, and I'm sure in terms of the funding, it's, it's not similar at all. I, I have in my head an idea to go to the Czech Republic and spend some time there and um, try and work out where it's all come from. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's had this idea, but um, it would be a nice place to go. Do we do we have a number of um, male Czech players in the top hundred? Because I, that is an interesting comparison because it's it's nowhere near the same. I suspect. Uh, I think there are two off the top of my head: Yuri Veselin, Veselin? Yuri, yeah, and Yuri Lecheka, Um who's a good player, by the way. Um, Le, uh, Le, it's Le they're Ch- both outside the top fifty. Yeah, they're seventy-five and seventy-nine. There's then Zdenek Kolar, who um, took a set off Stefano Tsitsipas and looked. He had a good a tournament. Player. He had a really good. Yeah, a really good tournament. Yeah, um, he. It's, inter- it's interesting that divide though, and sometimes you get. get I this can't in understand countries. it. I can't. Un- it's bizarre. It makes sense in China, where there are a lot of successful women and not many successful men, because um, Chinese people are smaller, like generally shorter. The average height there is much lower, and that's less of a problem in the women's game than it is in the men's game. Um, but yeah, I can't understand it in the Czech Republic. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. So. There's probably something to be found we'll out. We'll find there, out when you go there, James, and do exactly. a special when I do, from uh, Prague. Yeah, love tennis podcast Prague. Um, then, uh, then yeah, we'll find out. Uh, right, very finally, George, prediction for the final. I think we all know what you're going to say. Uh, yeah, Nadal in straight sets. Um, if Rude gets more than nine games, he's done very well. <laughs> so I'm going to say he's going to get eight games <laughs> i think i'll take the over uh because i think over you might nine. Get a set. yeah i think you might get a set i think you might, might get, get a, set. a set what what's your um kind of supporting evidence for believing that uh the roof's gonna be shut and that makes life quite tricky for everyone especially me because it'll last about four and a half hours <laughs> But, you know, basically I'm basing it on my weather forecasting, um, which has not been very reliable this week. The match that will probably give Rude the most possible hope is the one against Shapovalov um, in Rome just before this tournament. You know, that that is the match for Rude to cling on to. You know, he needs to hope he gets inhibited, stick in there as long as possible and take full advantage of the wounded lion if that happens. Um, Yeah. Which isn't really a great way of previewing a final, is it? He can only beat him if he's totally injured. That's not really what we want to happen, but no, it does seem the only way through to me at the minute. Indeed. Um, that's all we've got time for on this Love Tennis podlet, which has turned into a little bit more than a podlet, a kind of pod teenager. Um, we'll be back with a full-length pod after the French Open to look at everything that's happened over the two weeks and look forward to the grass court season. Um, we should say, because Calvin's not here and he would if he was, um, Henry Patton, who he coaches, and Julian Cash won the doubles title, uh, the challenger title, in a final set deciding tiebreak uh, yesterday. They've now won, I think I'm right in saying, 16 matches in a row, Julian Cash and Henry Patton. They are the in-form doubles pair in Britain at the moment. Uh, I think they are off to Nottingham this week. They won the title in Surbiton, and they're now off to Nottingham. I did see who they drawn, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but congratulations to them. Best of luck in Nottingham as well. And surely off to Wimbledon with a main draw wild card, you'd hope, on this form. George, we can't put that kind of pressure on the uh, the All England. <laughs> we we know that won't end well. The form, the form book's saying it all at the minute. You can't go on a 16-match winning streak and not be getting a main draw wild card, surely. Sh- surely. 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 Sports Social Podcast Network.